So I'm very happy to be back in uh, California. I uh, grew up in uh, Merced, Fresno area, Central Valley, and I spent about six years down in San Diego, Point Loma Nazarene University, went to college there, and uh, ended up uh, for seminary because I believed I was called into ministry. Um, I ended up uh, at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, DTS. Now, here's something that's really important about me and what, what I, who I really look up to. I really look up to a person by the name of Chuck Swindoll. He had a radio program called Insight for Living. He actually had a church in Southern California. He ended up planting a church in the Dallas area. And so when I found out, and I knew I was looking for an internship, uh, I was one of the first in line to sign up for an internship at his church. So me and several others signed up for this uh, internship, and guess what, guys? I got the golden ticket. I was in. My internship application was received, and I, guys, I was so excited. Now, I wasn't uh, Pastor Chuck's intern. I was just one of the interns uh, for men's ministry, but I was so excited because for me, I felt like I, I actually cut to the front of the line. I got, got the golden ticket. I was in. I would get to talk to Chuck Swindoll. And so there is actually this, uh, it's called A Thousand Miles of Chuck. Me and a bunch of interns piled into a van, and for a couple of days, we got to drive around with Pastor Chuck and talk to him, but we didn't really get an opportunity to really connect with him the way we wanted. So they put together a dinner. And for the dinner, we all got to sit around and give Pastor Chuck our questions, the real questions about ministry and life and everything. And I, and I, was, I, was, I was like, yes, this is my moment. This is my moment. So I was trying to think. I, mean, I, I want him to remember <laughs> Kevin McGill. So I needed to come up with an amazing question. Well, Pastor Chuck's a little bit older in his 60s, uh, uh, early 70s, and he's thinking about retirement. So I'm thinking, I want a question that will feel like really connects with him and that he really feels like, you know, I like this guy. He's the kind of guy I want around in ministry. So I'm trying to process. I'm like, okay, let's just come up with a real good question, a very profound question. And, um, you know, I thought, oh, for some reason, I thought of mice and men. And mice and men, at the very end of the book, there's an old man with an old dog. And they were telling Telling this old man, sorry, buddy, we've got to put your old dog down because it's time for him to go. And so the old man said, no, 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 don't do that because if you put the dog down, it's like putting me down. And so I'm thinking, I, somehow I've got to connect with mice and men and this old dog and Pastor Chuck retiring. So we're going around the circle and everyone is asking the questions. Now I'm starting to get flustered. I'm starting to get nervous. And I don't really know what to say, and, and I want to get the words just right. And so, the, so finally it comes to me, and the words start tumbling down, and I just say to him, you're old. <laughs> and it's like, no, no, not. What, what I mean to say is, you're an old dog. No, you're not an old dog. Um, you know when they want to take the old dog back out and shoot it? That's kind of like you. And Pastor Chuck's just like, What's wrong with you, bro? And looking back, what I realized was going on is I wasn't really there to learn. I wasn't there to grow. I wasn't there to be an intern, as is required of us, to grow and learn under someone. I was there to posture, to look good, to prove I have what it takes. I got in the golden ticket. I was in the front of the line. I was in my mind. I had arrived. What I was focused on was this idea of looking like, well, kind of like a hero, you know? But here's the problem. I wanted to be a hero without the journey. I wanted to be a hero without the way, without the road, without the challenges. I wanted to just jump in the front and prove to Pastor Chuck and whoever else is in the room, I have what it takes. A number of you guys, if, uh, if you've got your literature classes or English classes, you've probably heard the uh, term hero's journey. It was made popular by Joseph Campbell. And the basic idea with the hero's journey is 
in order to become the hero, you have to start from one place and move on to something else. And from that one place, you meet certain people along the way, you have certain challenges, there's a calling, and then when you finally take the big bad guy at the end, then you are a hero. And I recognize this to be true, as it was mentioned earlier, um, uh, about, probably about 10 years ago, I started a fantasy series, Nicholas and Company. And as I worked through the fantasy series and as I was writing it, there was something I recognized about the hero's journey, and it was probably why I didn't want to take the journey. I wanted to skip to the end and be perceived as a hero. There's something I recognize about heroes and all their journey. The hero is the weakest character. The hero starts weak. Think about it. You know, uh, uh, Luke does not know that there is a great empire out there that must be defeated. So he has no knowledge. He has uh, some abilities, but they haven't really be been developed. He needs a mentor to help him. Uh, he knows nothing about his place or potential place in the rebellion in Star Wars. So he starts off weak and he becomes strong. And that's what we want from a hero. No one wants a hero's tale when from the very beginning they're strong. If, if Luke, from day one, from that one shot with the two sons and he's looking off, if he is already a Jedi Knight, then the only thing that needs to happen is he hitches a ride to the Death Star. He finds Emperor Palpatine, says, Emperor Palpatine? Yeah, I'm Luke Skywalker. <laughs> right? That's three minutes. There is not enough time to bring in the Ewok so he can make merchant, you can get merchandising and get $3 billion for George Lucas. Right? You need... The journey from weakness to strength. You need the hero's journey, but the truth is, is I didn't want to take the journey. I just wanted to focus on me and how I came across and how people perceived me. Today, we're going to examine King Saul. And King Saul is a perfect example of a hero who doesn't want to take the journey. His main emphasis, and we see this all in 1 Samuel, is he's always worried about how people perceive him, but he never actually wants to do the hard work of a hero. And as we examine him, and as we walk through this particular passage, we're going to go ahead and point out in some areas, especially in light of the hero's journey, how we must take the journey. So if uh, you have your Bibles with me, the words will also be on the screen. But let's turn to 1 Samuel 14, verse 24. First thing that I want to point out is when you're a hero without the journey, your calling is not about God's kingdom, but your own. Your calling is not about God's kingdom, but your own. Own. What does this mean? So as Joseph Campbell explains, the first step in a hero's journey is the calling. You know, Frodo is called to take a ring to Mordor to save Middle Earth. That calling invites him to step outside of his security and his comfort zone and to take a journey to fulfill a particular task for someone else. That's a calling. A calling is Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is a professor, and he's very comfortable in his professorship. But at one point, he finds out there is an artifact that is not where it's supposed to be. The Nazis are going to get it into their hands. And so he stops them. And what does he say about artifacts? He says artifacts belong in what? A museum. His calling is to find rare artifacts and make sure they're in museums. But that is to, for him to step outside of his comfort zone and to lay himself down for something greater than himself. What we see here with King Saul is he doesn't see the calling about God. He sees it about himself. Verse 24, and the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day. What does that mean? What it means is King Saul was doing what most kings did back then. They're leading the soldiers out into battle. And as they're leading the soldiers out into battle, King Saul was leading them against the Philistines. And in this battle, things were not going well. 
can imagine as a leader, when things aren't going well, people begin to point to you and say, what's, what's going on? Is, is this the wrong strategy, the wrong tactic? Hey, buddy, you got to figure something out. We are trusting in you. So, and the men of Israel had been hard pressed that day. So Saul had laid an oath on the people saying, cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening and I am avenged on my enemies. And I am avenged on my enemies. So you, what he essentially tells them is, okay, all right, here we go. We got to win this battle, so I've got to motivate the troops. So you know what, troops? You cannot eat until we win. And if you eat, then curse be upon you, which is pretty much the death penalty. I'm sure in Saul's mind, he thinks he is motivating the troops, right? He is trying to rally the troops and get them excited. But I want us to look at that language again. What does he say here? He says, curse be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies, my enemies, people that are against me. But King Saul is King Saul over what? Israel, right? Who owns Israel? God. So if God is over Israel and Israel is in battle with some Philistines, then whose enemy are they actually fighting? God's enemies. So what is happening here is that King Saul has confused God's enemies with his. What he is essentially saying is, hey, if we're going out to battle, they're against me. And God, and we will see in a second, God is saying, no, no, no. They're against me. This is my battle. This is my war. This is my fight. So what's the problem here? Because King Saul is not taking the journey. He doesn't get the call. See, he is called to rule over Israel for the glory and fame of God, not himself and his ego. He is called to, to defend Israel for God's name sake, but he didn't get the call, so he thinks he's defending Israel for me, me. And so when this, this enemy comes out against him, he feels like it's an affront to his ego, his image, who he is, and so he lays this um, oath on the soldiers. You're against me. You're going after me. You're hurting me. You gave me what grade? That is against me. You left me out of what particular group? That is against me. You're, you're challenging me to do what? And you said what to me? That is against me. Isn't that the experience that we tend to have when someone affronts us? We feel like, well, they're coming after me. But if you've taken the journey and you've gotten the call, then you recognize that all that you are doing is for God's glory, not yours, God's ego, not yours. And so everything that you do, whether it's studying for a test or a particular group that you're in or in whatever environment that you're in, you understand that almost all your actions are for God and for a greater calling. And so when someone is an affront to you, you realize, you know what, this is not about me. This is God's fight. As a pastor, I, I tell you there's, Time after time, we have challenge after challenge. The best times in my pastoral ministry is when I stop and I say, this is not, it's not me. This is not my fight. This is not my battle. And the worst times in my pastoral ministry is when I forget my calling is to defend and protect the glory of God and to communicate, but to defend my own ego. And that's when I have the worst time in ministry. What I love about David King David, who comes after Saul, and the, the verses will not be on the screen, but um, if you go to 1 Samuel 17, 26, we see David before Goliath, and we know that story. Most of you guys probably know that story from Sunday school or something like it. So now David comes before Goliath. Listen to this powerful theological statement. He says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine. So David is standing before Goliath and he calls him an uncircumcised Philistine. He says that he should defy the armies of the living God. Defy the armies of David? No, 
Defy the armies of Saul? No, defy the armies of the living God. He goes on to say in 1 Samuel 17, 45, now he is standing right before, um, right, uh, right before Goliath. He says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the, all, of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You haven't defied me. You haven't defied King Saul. You've defied God but he knows his calling. He knows his calling. So we continue on, and the next thing I want to point out is that a hero, when you're a hero without the journey, you don't have allies on your journey, but slaves to your image. See, another part of the hero's journey, as Joseph Campbell points out, and we see in a number of um, stories in the Bible, another part of the hero's journey is this. Along the way, you have to prepare for the great battle at the end. What do you need along the way? You need allies, people who can speak into you, people who can, can share some information, people who can support you, have your back. Sometimes people who can challenge you when you need to be challenged. That's the relationship of the people around you. But we're gonna see here with King Saul is the only relationship he has with the people around him is they're there to serve and maintain his ego status. Verse 25. Now when all the people came to the forest, behold, there was honey on the ground. And when the people entered the forest, behold, the honey was dropping but no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. So here we have an oath that many scholars, it is assumed, was a bad oath. It was a bad oath. And so these uh, soldiers had been fighting all day. They probably burned six, 7,000 calories. They're hungry. There's honey on the ground, but they can't eat it so they can go back out and fight a battle. Why? Because they feared the oath. So already Saul's poor choice is subjugated his people. And he goes on to say in verse 28, then one of the people said, your father strictly charged the people with an oath saying, curse be the man who eats food for this day. Let me back up. Actually, verse 27. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Who's Jonathan? Jonathan is the son. King Saul. Everyone loves Jonathan. Jonathan wins all the battles. They love him. But Jonathan had not heard his father charged the people with the oath. So he put out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes became bright. So essentially he was hungry. He didn't know that his dad had restricted them and his eyes became bright. And we see the problem beginning to build. Verse 28, then one of the people said, your father strictly charged the people with an oath saying, curse be the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint, or as it said in the NIV, this is why the people are faint. So because of an oath he should not have made, he has not only uh, put people in a state of fear, but even Jonathan is now under the threat of death. Why? Because he was trying to posture himself. He had an image he had to maintain. He thought he could rally the troops with a really bad oath. When you skip the hero's journey, people are a slave to your image because the image is everything. In my household, my dad raised me with the character Superman. He loved Superman. He collected the comics, and so he passed on those comics to me. He went to the early Comic-Cons in, in 1975, 76, and he actually had, in 77, he had Christopher Reeve's outfit, the, the entire Superman suit with the blue leggings and the boots and the underwear on the outside and the cape. And he would wear that to Comic-Con. When I was 12 years old, I opened a box, and one day there it was, the Superman outfit. And so I did what any nerdy 12-year-old did. I put that sucker on. <laughs> I put on the whole thing, and I told my sister, hey, get, get your camera out. Oh, man, I'm going to want to show this to my future bride. When she saw it, she didn't want to see that again. And so I put on the outfit, and it's beautiful. I mean, you just kind of pan up, and there's like these red socks, and come to these blue cobalt tights, and the underwear on the outside, and the Superman shield. And it comes to this face who resembled Napoleon, or who resembled Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite. It all worked together. It was beautiful. It was a work of art. But for me, that signified one of my character flaws, how I looked, how I was perceived, that I was strong, 
and people liked me. And so for a lot of us, that's what that means too. How you look, how you're perceived, and everyone else around you is there to support your image and your ego, but they're not allies. God in his grace and mercy made sure I stayed on the path of the hero. Instead of trying to skip to the end, he sent allies along the way. One of my allies, one of my closest friends. Actually, um, I wasn't going to mention this individual, but uh, when, when Jenny and I came to the front row over here and we sat down, I looked to the right and there was a real good friend of mine, Tim Pike, and we go back, I think, at least 12, 13 years. And he surprised me. He lives in the area and I had this moment, yeah, that's an ally. I have another friend, um, Luke. We were actually roommates in college. And Luke is awesome because he's there for you. He'll support you, but he will call you out when you need to be called out. I, a couple of months ago, we were dealing with some stuff in ministry, and I was frustrated, and I was upset, and I was trying to handle it one particular way. And I remember on the phone, Luke said, stop it. Stop it. When I first met my wife, Jenny, and Jenny is caring and loving, and she shows her care and compassion um, practically. But one, she, can, she will also tell you what she thinks. So one of the first conversations we had out there in the parking lot at DTS, uh, she was telling me about a book that she was reading, and she loved it. And in my own tone-deaf way, I said, well, that book's not for me. That, that's for women. I, I don't read that kind of a book. And she said, well, you're a jerk. <laughs> you're a jerk. And then I thought, I didn't say it at the moment, but I thought, marry me. <laughs> I, in fact, I went home that night and I told my mom, I found the woman I'm going to marry. Do you have allies in your life that can speak into and support and help you along the way? Do people have to always manage your ego or can they speak to you and be honest with you when you need it? The last point I want to make is that if you are a hero without the journey, you will sacrifice all that you may win. When you get to the very end of any hero and their journey along the way, they come to a point of where they need to sacrifice, where they're willing to lay it all down for the greater good, for the calling. But King Saul is unable to do that. And as we've examined the story, what we see is that King Saul is absolutely incapable of putting himself first, and so that he can lay himself down so that others are protected. In fact, what he does is he tends to use and to abuse those around him so that he is safe. I want to point out something that Simon Sinek said regarding leadership. You might have heard of, of Simon Sinek. His, um, his talks are really popular. Um, his videos have made its rounds. There was one video that I really appreciated. He talked about why Captain Swenson received a Medal of Honor. There was this captain who received a Medal of Honor. And evidently what had happened is in Afghanistan, they were all pinned down. They were all shooting from every direction. And so Captain Swenson, he took on the job of carrying out the wounded and putting them on the helicopter to be flown out. Now, there was a video that showed this entire thing happening, and Simon Sinek shows it, and it's this very beautiful moment. While this captain is taking his wounded out, even though everyone is shooting at him along the way, as he's taking his wounded out, they put him on the helicopter, and at the very last minute, he did something very touching. He kissed one of the soldiers on the forehead and went back into battle. And Simon Sinek said, that is a leader. Leaders eat last leaders go last. But what's more important is that everyone around them will lay their life down for a leader because they know the leader will lay his or her life down for them. That is the sign of a leader. That's the sign of a hero. He goes on to point out 
when we ask them, why would you do that? He's talking to the soldiers. Why would you sacrifice yourself for your leader? Why would you give your blood and sweat and tears for that person? They all say the same thing because they would have done it for me. But then he points out in the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves that others may gain. In business, we're willing to give bonuses to people who are willing to sacrifice others that we may gain. In the business world and a lot of other environments, sometimes we're doing it wrong. Sometimes we're doing it wrong. As I think about my journey really for the last 15 years, but most of my life, I thought about how I was able to overcome some of these character flaws, these limitations, these moments of true selfishness. I thought about what, uh, I thought about your theme, story and spirit. Story and spirit. That is the only reason that I have come as far as I have, and overcome my own limitations, my own hubris, is because the Spirit whispers, speaks into my life, and says, it's not about you. It's not your fight. People are not slaves to your image. Follow me. I believe that the person that follows the Spirit will find themselves the hero that they deep down inside want to be. You may not even think of the word hero. You may just think, I want to go on to be a social worker and I want people's lives to be changed and yet when our own ego and our own image gets in the way, then we stumble over ourselves and the Spirit speaks in is, it reminds you that when you're a social worker, it's not about you, it's about them. It's not about what you're getting out of it, but about what you're giving to. And at the end of the day, when you show love and compassion to that person, it is about what they've received and that my name is glorified. Jenny and I, in a sense, are starting a new journey. And I I really feel like it's a new journey. A couple of months ago, we made the decision to adopt. And we already started the paperwork and I'm kind of freaking out. Why? Because it's really not going to be about me. But see, I have assurance. Having experienced what I've experienced since college and probably before, I have assurance that by the end of the journey, when it comes to starting this family and raising this child, that the Spirit will speak to me and to remind me what a hero truly looks like. It's not about me. It's about God. It's not about me. It's about taking care of those around me. It's not about me. It's about the others. And I want that for you. I want that for you. As you consider Maybe it's a year, two, three years away from a diploma. And as you think about the next steps, let me challenge you. If you really want to be the hero, take the journey. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.